Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Victoria Williams. I'm a program officer here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you all for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome Robert Kagan to the council this evening. Dr. Kagan's new book, The Jungle Grows Back in America and Our Impaired World, will be available for sale and signing after the program from our partners, the bookseller. Before we begin, please note that we are on the record and we are live streaming this event. Please note, uh, we ask you to silence your cell phones and views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. Thank you to our members in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. If you are not yet a member, please consider joining us. We have a wide range of levels for you to choose from. If you have any questions about membership, please visit one of our young professional ambassadors in the back of the room after the program. This program is part of our newly established Lester Crown Center on U.S. Foreign Policy. The generous gift from the Crown family supports all of the center's efforts and development of digital resources to make the Council's foreign policy content more accessible across platforms. Returning to today's program, Dr. Kagan's remarks will be followed by audience Q&A. We'll take questions from in the room and from online at chi.cnf.io. Now, by way of brief introduction, our speaker today is the Stephen and Barbara Friedman Senior Fellow with the Project and in International Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Robert Kagan is the author of numerous books, including the bestseller, The World America Created, and is a contributing columnist for the Washington Post. Previously, he served in the State Department on the policy planning staff as the principal speechwriter for Secretary of State George Schultz and Deputy for Policy in the Bureau of Inter-American Affairs. I will return to moderate audience Q&A, but for now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Kagan. Well, thank you, Victoria. I appreciate it, and thank you all for being here. Um, I know that uh, there are other things to do in Chicago. I'm told there are. So the fact that you're all here to uh, – I'm from Washington. There's nothing to do there. So that was not a crack at Chicago's expense, believe me. Um, I appreciate that you're here to, to, to talk about foreign policy, and I look forward to talking with you about it. I'm not going to – drone on for too long because I know, you know, we have a lot of questions about what America ought to be doing right now. Uh, and we should, we should hash them out because I think we're at a juncture in our history in terms of our role in the world. It's, we've been here before. We've had similar moments uh, where there were, you know, great debates about how the United States should relate to the rest of the world. There was sort of at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, uh, after World War One, after World War Two, after the Cold War, uh, and we are clearly at such a moment again. And I think it has been reflected in our political system. Uh, if you look at the election of 2016, as is usually the case, it was not primarily about foreign policy, but I think foreign policy was part of the discussion. And I think if you look at the four sort of major political figures of the last election, uh, which who were, you know, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, and uh, Barack Obama. I think uh, really only one of those four stood relatively forthrightly for continuing the general approach toward foreign policy that the United States has been uh, uh, taking for the past seven decades or so. I think the others reflected a continuing uh, public view. I think the majority of Americans uh, generally agree that the United States has been too involved in the world. The cost of our involvement has been too high. The results have been too uh, unremarkable, if not unsuccessful, and that really it's time for us to show uh, some, the, peop the words that people say are restraint, some humility, uh, some recognition of the limits of our power. And so that is the debate that we're having, whether it is possible to do that and whether it's desirable to do that. Um, my argument is going to be that we need to be very careful about choosing that course. Uh, and I think the reason I argue that is I think we're not, I think we have forgotten uh, what the world looks like when the United States doesn't play this large role. We are all too familiar of the cost, with the cost of playing the role, 
We've seen the mistakes that America makes, and America makes many mistakes. Uh, we've seen the costs, obviously, in terms of lives as well as money, and we've also seen the moral costs, because any time you wield power, there are immoral consequences, as, as I think anyone who's serious about the world understands. Um, but I think it's easy to lose sight of what the cost of not playing this role is. And in order to think about that, I think we have to pull the lens back a little bit and go over a little history that I think most of us know, but we don't always uh, think about very much when we're in the present moment um, and seeing the mess all around us. Uh, there's, a, there's a book out by a by a, a fellow I know named Ben Rhodes. I know him from Washington, uh, and the book is called The World As It Is. And this was a big mantra of the Obama administration in foreign policy, at least, which is that we need to accept the world as it is and not think that we can change it. And I'm all for humility, but then this is my point. I'm not sure that Ben or many of us really understand what the world as it is really looks like. And the reason is we've been living in something that is not really the world as it is for seven decades. We've been living in a remarkable period uh, in history. And I think it's worth reviewing how remarkable it's been because of course we can see all the, the negative aspects of this world. It's filled with violence and hatred and inequality uh, and all the other uh, problems that we can identify. Uh, but if you think of it in historical terms, it's a remarkable period in three fundamental ways. Uh, the first has to do with the general prosperity of the period since uh, the end of the Second World War. Throughout history, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, if you tried to measure what annual global GDP growth was uh, centuries ago or millennia ago, uh, you can imagine, and economists who've tried to measure this have uh, pointed out that the, an the annual GDP growth of the world was zero. Uh, there was no real growth. The, the great mass of human beings lived in abject poverty. The tiniest, tiniest fraction of human beings lived uh, in a situation of wealth, but the world was basically a world of poverty. This began to change in a fundamental way with the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th and 19th century, uh, and then the world enjoyed something like 1.5% global GDP growth, and it was located almost entirely in the transatlantic uh, world. Uh, what we've seen since the end of Second World War, uh, even despite re deep recessions and other economic problems, uh, has been a global annual GDP growth of uh, something about 4%, which if you think about the size of the global population is really an enormous jump in terms of prosperity. And in not just located uh, in the transatlantic world, in fact, not even primarily located in the transatlantic world, but in places as we now know, like China and India uh, and Latin America and elsewhere that did not enjoy growth during the period uh, prior to this. Um, and during this period, we've seen four billion people lifted out of poverty or lifting themselves out of poverty uh, into some kind of middle class existence. You may have seen there was an article uh, recently about how, uh, you know, we've really turning into, uh, except for what some refer to as the bottom billion, which still is a crisis and a problem, but we're turning into a middle class world, which is an incredible accomplishment compared to the rest of history. Uh, secondly, and I think also equally obvious to all of us, has been the enormous spread of democracy during this period. Before uh, World War II, democracy was the rarest form of government in the world. Throughout most of history, it was more an accident than anything else. Uh, and since World War II, we've seen an explosion of democratic governments. Uh, up over 100, uh, I think it reached a high of around 115 or so before it began to slip back. Again, an absolutely extraordinary period in history. Uh, most people, through, most human beings throughout history lived in very, under various forms of tyranny. Uh, they did not live in democratic societies, so we've seen that. And I think related to this, undergirding it, uh, and also supported by it, has been 
uh, and it, uh, by historical terms, a long period of great power peace. Um, throughout uh, all recorded history, the great powers, whether they be empires or city-states or nation-states, have been almost in constantly at war with one another. You can barely find a year uh, of the last 5,000 when there wasn't some war going on among great powers. Uh, and that has not been the case uh, since World War II. Uh, we have had wars, we've had devastating smaller wars, but we haven't had the kind of cataclysmic great power conflict of the kind that we saw between world, uh, in World War I and World War II before, uh, you know, in, this, in the first half of the 20th century. So any one of these qualities would make this a unique period. Uh, the three of them together make it a remarkably unique period and something uh, like a miracle, uh, you know, in historical terms. And as is often the case when you have successes like this, I think we've gotten to the point where we take it for granted. And we, uh, on the one hand, can think only about the negative aspects of this world, but also we think that it, uh, it sort of will last forever, that it's a product of evolution. That was uh, a very common thesis, uh, not just by Frank Fukuyama, but perhaps best exemplified by Frank Fukuyama's End of History essay uh, in, uh, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, the belief that, you know, the, the human race had reached a new plateau of existence. We were just better than we used to be. Either, either it was Frank's argument, his Hegelian idea that the better idea had finally won, that liberal democratic capitalism had basically defeated in the realm of ideas uh, and in terms of delivering the goods, so to speak, the other alternatives. Or if you look at uh, the writings of Steven Pinker, who has documented uh, how much better the world is and how much better human behavior is now than it has ever been before. He attributes it to the victory of enlightenment ideals. Other have attributed it to technological and scientific uh, 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 evolution and the, 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 the sort of wisdom about the human behavior that this is supposed to bring. All of these are part of an enlightenment concept and we're all children of the enlightenment, which believes in the idea of progress and not just material progress and scientific progress, but also human progress. And so, as I say, we sort of came to believe that we've achieved this plateau with all its flaws, and we don't have to worry about regression, because progress in the Enlightenment view uh, is always forward. We have a teleological view of history that we're moving uh, in a certain direction. Well, I think we need to recognize, and certainly my view is that that is a myth that we've created, it's a myth in part induced by the success of this period, uh, but I think we need to recognize, and I think we can see the signs all around us, uh, that th there is no real progress in terms of human behavior. There is scientific and technological progress, but there's no inevitable progress in terms of human morality. And people are generally the same at diff throughout history. And what I want to argue is what affects their behavior, what affects the behavior of nations and even people within nations is a certain configuration of power and ideas in the international system. And what I attribute this remarkable period to is not the evolution of the human species, but a, a configuration of power that occurred after World War II and the defeat of two aggressive dictatorships uh, and the triumph of a nation that happened to be uh, born with enlightenment principles and also happened to be the most powerful nation in the world. Uh, and was able to impose, and I want to emphasize the imposition of this, impose its values both on defeated powers and to some extent on allied powers and basically created the possibility for what we call uh, this period of progress. 
Um, every, there have been many orders throughout history, and every order reflects the predilections of the most powerful nations within that order. And this order has been dominated, as it happens, by a democratic capitalist power, and so not surprisingly, the international system has reflected that. Now let me hasten to say that I'm not at all claiming a kind of American exceptionalism in the sense that I think Americans are a better people. Americans are people like everybody else. They are selfish, they are foolish, they are short-sighted, um, they make mistakes. But the United States found itself almost by a condition of geography in a unique position after World War II to make this world possible. The fact that it was a rich, powerful nation that was essentially an island nation distant from all the other great powers, the fact that it was not surrounded by other great powers that it had to fear, with all respect to Canada and Mexico, um, made it possible for the United States, if it chose to try to isolate itself from the world, which it did for a while, but it also made it possible to provide solutions to problems that had not previously had a solution. And specifically, what I'm talking about are the cycles of conflict uh, that, that were ongoing in Europe and in Asia, uh, which the United States put an end to. And I just want to reflect on what that was exactly. Ever since the rise and unification of German power, in the last quarter of the 19th century, Europe entered into a cycle of instability and conflict that led to three major wars, the Franco-Prussian War uh, of 1870, World War I, and World War II. And the problem was that because Germany was so big, both demographically, uh, economically, and also eventually militarily, it was too big for Europe to balance. The uneasy balance that existed after the defeat of Napoleon was upset by the rise of a unified Germany. And, and war after war did not create a stable equilibrium, but led to more war. Similarly, in Asia, the rise of Japan and its removal from its self-imposed isolation uh, in the late 1860s uh, created another cycle of conflict where Japan was seeking uh, for all kinds of reasons to, uh, uh, to, to gain hegemony and land in the region at almost entirely at China's expense. And what we saw beginning in the late 19th century was a cycle of conflict between Japan and China instigated by Japan, uh, uh, but, but almost an endless cycle of warfare. The United States in World War II not only put an end to that, but put, in effect, a permanent end to that by stationing its own forces and committing to the defense and security of these regions, by transforming, and this is you know, critically important to all the three elements of this order that I'm talking about, by transforming two, these two aggressive dictatorships into Pacific democracies, it laid the foundation in these two regions for this explosion of prosperity and peace and democracy that we've seen. And so by playing this role in a very concrete sense, I'm not talking about idealistic dreams of a better world, I'm talking about solving specific problems that had plagued the world and which dragged the United States into two world wars. By solving these problems, the United States laid the foundation uh, for this what we call the liberal world order uh, today. And therefore, you know, what can be solved by practical means can be undone by practical means. It was not, as I say, just because human beings got better that we lived in this world, but because fundamentally a, a direction of history had been altered and, and altered to some extent by power and by the creation of a new configuration of power. And so when that configuration becomes undone, either because the, the powers that created it lack the capacity to maintain it, or because they lack the will or interest in maintaining it, we will get a different kind of order, or more likely, a return to the disorder uh, and chaos that we saw in the first half of the 20th century. 
My argument is, is that we somehow have convinced ourselves that the world we're living in is the normal world or a new normal, when in fact the world we're living in is an aberration. It is not where history was headed before it was created, and it's not where history will go after it uh, dissolves. And that's sort of the crisis that we are confronting right now. And the metaphor I use in the book and uh, to describe the situation that we're in uh, is one of a garden. And I'm not much of a gardener, but I think I understand the principles of how gardens work. Um, I'm sure some of you are gardeners. And there are a couple of things to be said about a garden. The first is it's a creation, it's artificial. It's something that uh, humans impose on the land. Uh, it's not what nature creates. It's what humans create. And having planted a garden, as I'm sure you gardeners know, you don't plant a garden and say, great, I've planted the garden, and now I can just enjoy the garden. You have to constantly weed the garden, and you have to cut back the vines that want to grow into the garden. Nature wants to take the garden back. The forces of nature are constantly operating against it, and in order to preserve your garden, you need to be constantly working and fighting back and pushing back against the jungle. And that's the metaphor that I use to describe our situation uh, when it comes to the liberal world order. The liberal world order is also artificial and a creation, and it is not what nature would naturally produce. In the international system, nature produces anarchy and chaos and conflict. Uh, that was what we saw evolving uh, before uh, the end of World War II. Uh, there's no natural equilibrium in the international system, and there's certainly no natural desire for peace among nations. Nothing in human history suggests that such a thing exists if you look at the behavior of nations. That's the nature of the international system. And what about human nature? We tend to emphasize and want to emphasize the positive elements of human nature. The sort of underlying principle of the end of history thesis was that human beings naturally seek recognition of their rights and their dignity as individuals. And the only system that provides this recognition in an acceptable form is liberal democracy. And it's true that that is things that humans seek sometimes. Sometimes humans seek other things. Sometimes they seek security, which they feel can only be found in family and tribe and nation. Sometimes humans want a strong leader to take charge and protect them and also show them what to do because of course choice is problematic. And human beings also escape choice sometimes when they can. We know that human nature is something that is at odds with itself. It, it's about love and it's about hate. It's about selfishness and it's about caring for others. It's about uh, seeking the higher good and seeking the base. The human nature is constantly at war with itself and the determination of which element of human nature is going to succeed at any given time is often shaped by external forces. The founders of our democratic system uh, created a, a system which I think recognized that human beings were like that and tried to create a system that would channel their passions and angers and hatreds in the most productive way possible so that what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature would triumph in the end. And I think they did a pretty good job of that. But it's not an easy thing to do here, as we are seeing more and more in our own country. And it's certainly not an easy thing to do uh, in the international system. And so in the international system, natural forces are constantly working against democracy, against peace, uh, against prosperity and cooperative and all the cooperative elements that make prosperity possible. And we're seeing that all around the world today. And if you want to say, well, who's to blame for these, this eruption of nationalism and tribalism here in the United States or in Europe, 
or who's to blame for the fact that geopolitics has returned uh, as you look at the behavior of Russia and China. Uh, if you want to say, the answer is nature is to blame. These are natural phenomena and we should not be shocked by them. And we need to recognize that just as in the past, dealing with these natural phenomena is a constant struggle, just the way keeping a garden intact is a constant struggle. Uh, I have not, at this part of my discussion, and we can discuss it in our Q&A, talk to you about where specifically we need to do what and where we shouldn't do what, and those choices do need to be made, and we need to learn from our mistakes, uh, which we're not often very good at doing, by the way. Uh, but the possibility of getting off the planet is not one that we have uh, really before us. Uh, ever since the nation was born, the two oceans have led us to believe and hope that the rest of the world can go to hell and will be fine. And after World War I, that was the determination that Americans made. They decided World War I was a terrible mistake and they were never gonna let that happen again. And we pursued a course of as much non-involvement as possible. It's not isolationism. It's the desire to not take on responsibility. I think we need to understand the distinction. Americans are not isolationists. But there are times when, understandably, they want to l let down the burden of responsibility that they've carried. And by the way, that is an entirely understandable uh, feeling. And I think it's worth pointing out, and I don't think this is appreciated sometimes by the rest of the world, except at the moment when the United States looks like it wants to get out of the game. But the United States has played a role in the world that no other nation in the history of the world has played. The United States took on responsibility after World War II for maintaining a certain kind of world order. And they did it in their interests. It wasn't a favor to anyone. When people like Dean Acheson and George Marshall and Harry Truman and during the war Franklin Roosevelt set out this vision of America taking responsibility uh, for maintaining some kind of order, it's because they'd lived through the consequences of not doing that. They weren't idealistically trying to create uh, some kind of heaven on earth. They were quite pessimistically trying to prevent sliding back to the horrors that they had all witnessed in the course of their lifetimes in the first half of the 20th century. So this is not something that Americans did simply out of the goodness of their hearts. Nevertheless, it was and has been an absolutely unusual role to play with all the burdens that it uh, requires and, and has placed on Americans. And nothing could be more normal for Americans to say, as they do say and as they have said in the past, why can't we be a normal nation? Why can't we just look out for our interests in the same way that all other nations generally do. America first should not be an alarming concept to anyone. All nations put themselves first in some fundamental way. What makes America first problematic for us is that America, by if it chooses that course, will unfortunately be responsible for allowing this world order to break down because only America can sustain it. And that's really the choice that we need to face right now. Are we willing to continue paying the price of sustaining this order? And uh, by the way, I want to be clear about what that price is. It is mistakes because human beings make mistakes. It is moral ambiguity at best, because wielding power is a morally ambiguous activity, and it means cost. This is something that the great uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the, the great philosopher of the mid 20th century, talked a lot about. Uh, he wanted Americans to understand, in a way, the tragic element of the role they had to play, because that role was filled with moral ambiguity and filled with costs. 
Um, and, but it's a little bit like what Winston Churchill famously said about democracy. It's the worst option except for all the others. And I think that's what we have to, in a very sober way, with a very sort of almost a tragic understanding of the realities of the world, of the world as it really is, that for all the costs that we have to bear to sustain this world order, the price of not sustaining it is so much higher and will ultimately fall on us as well. And so it is actually a lower cost to continue this order than it will be if the order breaks down and we have to reestablish it again. Now again, I'm not saying that means we have to do X, we have to do Y, we, we can have that discussion because that's what statesmanship is about, making those choices. But I do want us to understand at the highest level of policy what our big choices are. Once we decide that we need to play, continue playing this role, we can decide how best to play it. But we do need to make that decision. And right now, I think American people, the American people are undecided. So let me end on that uh, happy note and uh, look forward to your questions and our discussion. Thanks very much. Great. We'll open it up to audience Q&A. Uh, remember, you can submit your questions online at chi.cnf.io. But I think we'll start in the room. We'll wait um, for the microphone to come to you. And please make sure that your question is a question. We'll come up here, right here to the corner. Hi, you asked what is the, we have to ask ourselves what is the cost of continuing this role? I think I, the question I have for you is, well, what's the cost of us not continuing this role and isn't that far greater than the cost of us continuing it? Well, I mean, exactly, that's, that's, that's the point. And, and I think, you know, I could go through what the costs are because, for instance, I think we think, well, China is a problem, and Russia is a problem, and Iran is sort of a problem, um, and terrorism is a problem, and we can see all those. But my concern is actually that it goes well beyond that, and that in particular, the basic order of, this basic peaceful order that was created in Europe after World War II is itself also at risk. Uh, that we could, despite our disbelief in the possibility of this, we could return to a Europe that has renationalized, that has broken down, uh, and that is, uh, you know, returning to the Europe that we once knew. Not Nazi Germany, but you don't need Nazi Germany to have a problem. Uh, and if you look at what's going on in Europe today and you see the rising nationalism on all sides, if you see the retreat of democracy in parts of it, if you see the protectionism which is driven in the first instance by the United States now, these are all the attributes that made Europe a dangerous place before. Uh, and similarly in Asia, we worry about China. The day could come when we have to worry about Japan too. Because again, you know, we created a situation where countries like Japan and Germany were sort of by their very nature non-geopolitical. We sort of told them in no uncertain terms that they could make a lot of money and they could live a prosperous existence and they could be protected by us, uh, but they had to give up geopolitical ambitions. Well again, that's not natural to give up geopolitical ambitions and if we don't continue playing this role, geopolitical uh, 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 traditions uh, will return. Great. We'll take a question just right here. The microphone's coming to you. Yes. I wonder if um, the environmental problem is a problem for your garden and that somehow this is a fourth a pillar uh, or, or weeds that we have to take care of. And should America be leading on that as well? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's where my metaphor really gets real, doesn't it? Um, no, and I think, you know, if we, first of all, I've always been pessimistic that uh, any people will make the sacrifices necessary in the near term in order to uh, save themselves in the long term, or more specifically save their children or their grandchildren. Because again, that's not what human nature necessarily does. So it has required 
a leadership that has been lacking. Um, but the problem is also a geopolitical one uh, because in order for countries to get together and decide that they're going to uh, make the collective sacrifices uh, that need to be made, they would have to feel that it was safe to limit their growth. So if you look at countries like China and India, you know, they are going through a phase uh, of development that we have already gone through. Um, and for us, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy uh, for them when they say, wait a minute, you already got rich this way and now you're telling us we can't get rich this way. And, and for a country like China, rich isn't just about rich, it's also about power. And so we're asking them uh, to limit their power in the international system in the name of this collective good. So geopolitical competition is another, uh, you know, obstacle, as is human nature. So I mean, the kind of global, we're so far from having the kind of world uh, where you could imagine countries actually getting together and setting aside or suppressing these natural aspects of the, of the human condition that it, it leads one to be extremely pessimistic. And you know, obviously to some extent a lot of my argument will be moot if the planet, if the planet becomes unlivable. Um, but uh, the, the, the worst news is we're heading in the opposite direction when it comes to global cooperation. Um, and it will be worse and worse the more this order collapses. Uh, this order obviously has not solved that problem, but our only hope of solving that problem is in this order. Great, we'll take a question right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, how can we focus on so many other countries when we're having all these divisiveness in this country between Democrat, Republican, men, women, black, white, et cetera. It, it's, it's really alarming to me. How do you think we're gonna deal with that? How can we solve others' problems when we've got our own? It's not only an excellent question, but it's a question that I raise in the book as well. I mean, you know, it, it, it does require, for the United States to shoulder this responsibility requires a certain health in the American system itself. Now, I don't want to overstate the degree to which the United States was ever healthy politically. I mean, we, we, we lived through the McCarthy period um, and nevertheless accomplished things in the world. I don't think that it precludes domestic division doesn't preclude our uh, playing this role in the world, but it certainly is a major obstacle, especially if uh, we begin to have doubts about democracy itself, which is, I think, increasingly uh, a question here, and it's even more of a question uh, in Europe. Uh, democracy, you know, people lost faith in democracy in the 1930s, and not just because of the Depression. And so we can't assume faith in democracy. And if we don't have faith in democracy, then we're not obviously going to be in the business of creating a democratic world. So we do have to restore uh, ourselves in some way. Now, I'm more optimistic about us than I am about the world. And the reason I say that, and this is a whole other speech, so I'll try not to do it for too, too long, is that at the end of the day, all this talk about what about nationalism, um, you know, Americans at the end of the day only have one nationalism, and that is the nationalism based on the principles of the Declaration of Independence. We have had many moments in our history when uh, you know, there have been a, a, a desire to insist that white Protestant America is American nationalism. There has been white nationalism, which I, I want to separate from white supremacism, but a sense that that is what, you know, even, even the late Sam Huntington wrote about this uh, provingly in his last books. But we have to understand that the principles that uh, unite us as a people are the principles of the Declaration. If you look at our history, those principles have always conquered these other definitions of nationalism. In one case, it took a civil war, and I hope it doesn't take a civil war this time. But the one thing that's true about the United States is that from the beginning, we've seen the continual uh, 
expansion of protected rights. We've seen very little backsliding in that respect. We've seen continual progress. So I'm optimistic that we, and we've gone through these periods before. I could point to any, I'm sure you could think of many times in American history where we have been like this, but we have come out of it. So I believe we will eventually come out of it. I don't know how long it will take, but we will come out of it. My concern is, and it's related to your question, by the time we come out of it, I don't know if there's anything to be left to save in the world. Because the world doesn't sit around waiting for us to get our act together. The world moves on, and in fact exploits the fact that we don't have our act together. And that's my fear, that we will come together eventually, but by then it'll be too late. Great, we'll take a question just right here. I wanted to ask a quick question about the garden. If I put you in charge of one field, and I put her in charge of another field, and I provide economic prosperity as a, an equivalency of democracy, and liberal democracy. And I'm not saying I believe this, but I think it's an argument that the other folks have said, is that shouldn't I rely upon you as the gardener of that field to produce the kind of economic benefits for all of your people that will sustain worldwide democracy? I mean, the answer is yes. The other answer is it's never going to happen as much as we would like it to happen. And again, I find myself always wanting to say, I can think of many ways in which the world could be better than it is now. I can't think of many actual times in history when it has been better. And so, and I think it's very, enlightenment and American to say, yes, we've reached this plateau, but we need to go beyond, and we need to take care of those who we're not taking care of, and I think that the answer to that is yes. What I, the only thing I object to is because we are imperfect, and I don't mean imperfect in delivery, but even imperfect in motive, imperfect in our souls, therefore the order is not worth saving. That's, that's my, print. not that I, believe me, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the failures, but I have to always say, compared to what? And so I, I, you know, there is a tendency to say that we have failed to accomplish what we ought to be accomplishing, and therefore we have to try something else entirely. My argument would be, we have to take what we've accomplished and keep trying. Uh, but unfortunately, as I say, the trend now is in the opposite direction. Would that we only had the problem of improving ourselves. Right now, I feel we have the problem of saving ourselves. A question from online. Um, the question is, do you consider the United States as a responsible global stakeholder at this moment in history? <laughs> Well, first of all, I would say we've never been a completely responsible stakeholder, so I don't want to overstate our wonderfulness uh, at any time in our history. Um, but I would say that at this moment, in relative terms, we are sort of overtly taking less responsibility for what is going on around the world than we have in the past. And when we have a president who gets up at the United Nations and even dispenses with our usual hypocrisy. I mean, usually, even if we're not being that good, we certainly say that we are trying to be good or that we mean to be good. He dispensed with hypocrisy and said, we're in it for ourselves and you should be in it for yourselves. And that will make the world go around. And I think that that is, you know, that's a remarkable statement. Even in the 20s and 30s when, you know, Americans are accused of having been isolationists, no president would ever have gotten up in an international forum and said, we're looking out for us and you take care of yourselves, which is the message of his UN speech. So I would say, and by the way, I have to say, I don't think I can be speaking about this audience because if you were this, you wouldn't be here at the Chicago <laughs> Council. But I didn't see a great uproar among Americans at the fact that he said that. I, the, pre, you know, the media, the, uh, the elites, you know, people like me were flabbergasted, et cetera, but the, the country was like, yeah, sounds good to me. Um, and that's a problem. And that's a problem because I think Americans are very much of a mood to say, yep, we're gonna look out for us. 
and good luck to the rest of you. And that is where things, be, you know, that is the essence of things falling apart. Great, we'll take a question just right up here, first row. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming to Chicago and sharing your thoughts this evening. Um, Post-World War II, there was a true existential ideological competition with the Soviet Union, which lasted into the early 90s. And imposing a world order made a lot of sense then. Post the collapse of the Soviet Union, you look at the nuclear armaments of the major powers, how do you get a major power conflict today? I don't understand how that can happen. Well, those are both, you made two points there, and I, and I think they're both, they're both good points. Here's what I would say, though, and I think, you know, this is a fine, this is sort of like, it's a historical detail, but it's an important historical detail, so let me start with that. The idea that this world order needed to be created, I think it's important to remember, preceded the Cold War. And in fact, those who were thinking about this, and it really the thinking about it began during and even before the, we entered World War II, they thought the Soviet Union was gonna be an ally. You know, people like Dean Anderson and Harry Truman and Franklin Roosevelt definitely did not anticipate a Cold War or a confrontation with the Soviet Union. And like most strategists or, or p political strategists, they weren't thinking about the future, they were thinking about the past. They were creating an order that would prevent what had just happened from happening again. So I think it's important to realize that then the Cold War comes almost immediately. And I think in a lot of minds of Americans, and by the way, I'm talking about people like Graham Allison even, uh, you know, the famous political scientist and international relations theorist, fused these two things, the order that was created to prevent a descent into chaos and the order that was also used to deal with the Soviet Union, so that when the Soviet Union and the, and the Cold War ended, we forgot how come we'd started this in the first place, and we'd started it to prevent a slide back into chaos and, and the disasters. And so, for me, the Cold War is an ancillary fact. And in a way, I think we put too much emphasis on the Cold War um, because I think that the most important development of the post-war period was the conversion of Germany and Japan. Soviet Union was always going to be, I mean, I, took, I take seriously the threat posed by the Soviet Union, I take seriously the threat posed by international communism, but we can see now that the Soviet Union, like Russia, is always gonna be on the outside looking in. And it was really this order that we created that was so uh, important. And so, for me, I don't want to, the Cold War played in a critical role in getting Americans to sustain this support. That's a critical point, and if that's the point you're making, I entirely agree. Americans convinced themselves that communism was an existential threat, whether it was or it wasn't, and that was enough to keep them doing it. And yes, when the Cold War ended, Americans said, so great, now we don't have to do this anymore. And that's the mistake, in my view. Now, on the nuclear weapons front, this is, you know, this is a very, uh, a very reasonable argument. I would say two things about it. One is that I believe we can have a conventional war between nuclear powers. And one of the reasons I believe that is because the United States and China are planning for one every single day. Now, you'll say, but how could you be sure that a conventional war stays conventional? And that's a very good question. But can we start a conventional war among great powers? I think we can. And you know, it, it a little bit cracks me up because during the Cold War, a lot of people lived in very justifiable fear that there would be a nuclear war someday. Well, now we have a world in which there are gonna be five, six, seven, eight, nine nuclear powers, maybe 10, maybe 11, maybe 12, but we're, we're good with that because now we don't believe that somehow nuclear powers can go to war with each other. I find that an odd kind of, to juxtapose those two views. I think we were right the first time. If, if the first half of the 20th century taught us anything, it's that no weapon will go unused. You can't count on any weapon going unused. And after all, we did use nuclear weapons. And 
but we used a lot of other weapons and we used them against each other. So I just think it's a very risky business to say, don't worry, everybody's got nuclear weapons. John Mearsheimer, who's here in Chicago and who has a new book out, has made that argument. We should give everybody nuclear weapons because that'll keep the peace. I've never really found that to be a comforting thought. Great. We'll take a question just right here. Um, well, again, thanks for your remarks. Um, in your initial comments, you hinted at um, you know concrete policies or positions that you would want to take um, in our uh, right now. Um, if you know if you were crafting policy at the highest level, so I was just wondering if you could state you know a few concrete foreign policy objectives that you know our country should um, should be taking right now in order to you know preserve this liberal democratic world order. Great. Yeah. No, I'm I'm happy to do that. Uh, I'll start with China because I think China presents the nearest term and most obvious challenge. And I think that, you know, I have almost the opposite view of China than the one that the current administration is taking, and I think that most Americans support. Because while I think China should be punished for its unfair trading practices, I think we need to take very serious steps to keep China from penetrating our high-tech sector, especially in areas where they can, where it has uh, military uh, uh, aspects. And obviously, I do think China, if it hasn't already begun to do so, will pursue the route that Russia has pursued in trying to use uh, technology to affect our internal political system. So I'm not opposed to dealing with China on the economic and technology fronts. I think it's important. What worries me is that while we do that, while we squeeze China economically, while we cause China pain on the geoeconomic competition, are we adequately deterring their other possible response? You know, when it's one thing for us to crack down on Japan, on Japanese unfair practices, as we did in the 1980s, Japan is, was a dependent ally. They didn't have any other options but to negotiate as hard as they could. China has other options. And if you look at the history of great powers, most great powers, and this certainly applies to China, they don't make a separation between geoeconomics and geopolitics. They don't make a separation between economic power and military power. It's all power. So while we're thinking about jobs and fairness, which are reasonable, unfortunately, they're thinking about power. And so what I worry about, as we read in the papers, if, you know, about how the balance, the military balance in the region is shifting increasingly against the United States, uh, how can we be sure that while we squeeze China and win on the economic front, they don't take it out on us and our allies uh, on the military and geopolitical front? So that leads me to my key recommendation, which is, and this is the last thing that the American public and Congress want to hear right now. But we need to be sure as we go down this path that we effectively deter China from pursuing military action in the region, because that is how the order collapses. Uh, you know, if it were me, in the best of all possible worlds, I would offer the same deal to China that we offered to Germany and Japan and Britain and France after World War II, which was go get rich, Go get prosperous, improve your social welfare, be a, uh, be a major economic power with that kind of influence in the world, but do not pursue military ambitions. And so I would be strong militarily and relatively cooperative on economics. And right now we're pursuing the opposite strategy and it makes me a little nervous. So that's, that's one. And the other is, we need to take a lot more active role in Europe. I think after the EU was formed, we decided, well, the Europe is done, they're peaceful, they're on their own, we don't have to think about them anymore. That was ahistorical. The truth is, and I would say this, there may be Europeans in this audience, but I would say this if this was a European audience, and I have said it to a European audience, Europe does not work without deep American involvement. That is what the 20th century taught us. 
Even in 1990, when Germany was going into reunification, the United States had to play a critical role to the administration of George H.W. Bush in reassuring France and Britain and the other powers that a unified Germany was not too frightening to accept. So when something as critically important as Brexit occurs, we should do our best to try to soften the divorce and do our best to soften the reunification that has to occur. We should be heavily involved in that in our own interests, but we're not. We're sort of standing back and letting Europe do whatever it wants to do, and ultimately I think that will redound against us. So I could talk about more. I could talk about Syria, where I think we made a mistake, an understandable mistake. We overreacted to Iraq, so we did didn't do any enough in Syria, so we created this, we were participating in creating this massive refugee flow, which then destabilized Europe. So what we thought was a peripheral problem turned out to be a problem in the core. Um, and so I think we need to address that uh, as well. But those are, those are some basics. Great, we'll take a question from the lady in the back. Hello, uh, my question is, uh, should there be limits to US foreign interventions? And you mentioned Iraq, and I'm thinking about the staggering number of civilian casualties and, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there should be limits, and, and we sh when, we, when we do intervene, we should intervene intelligently and effectively, and I do think that one of the reasons there were so many casualties is because we, we went in a, a, a expecting, as someone said, a cakewalk, and we really didn't take the kind of responsibility that we should have in Iraq to provide basic order, which led to the, the uprisings and the civil war, which were, uh, which have led to so many civilian casualties. Now, we could debate whether it was right to go into Iraq at all, and I think there is obviously a, a, a good debate to be had on that front. Um, and we will face those kinds of questions again. And so in principle, I would say, of course, there needs to be limits on American intervention. It's just a question of knowing what those limits are. And I must say, having given this a lot of thought, um, I have a hard time coming up with a doctrine that tells you exactly where you should intervene and exactly where you shouldn't intervene. You can have a doctrine of saying, we'll never intervene. That, that you could understand. I think, unfortunately, it would not necessarily lead to good things all the time. Or you could have an inter the doctrine where we intervene all the time, which obviously is ridiculous. So we're left with the difficult questions that we're always left with. You know, when should we and when shouldn't we? Forget about Iraq, think about Vietnam. In 1964 and 65, the general consensus among everybody from the New York Times editorial page to Democrats and Republicans to administrations uh, of both parties thought that it was absolutely vital to prevent Vietnam, South Vietnam from falling to communism. And now we look back on that because we're so smart and we know that that was a stupid decision. No one knew it was a stupid decision at the time. So when the President Obama says, let's have a doctrine of not doing stupid stuff, I'm all for that. The problem is we don't know what's stupid until it turns out to be stupid sometimes. And so we are left with this problem of not knowing. And we're left with the, the two kinds of dangers, not doing enough, which we tried in the 20s and 30s, and doing too much, which we tried maybe in the 1990s and 2000s. But the answer is we need to find the right moment, the right balance, the right understanding, and there's no magic formula for it. Great, well that's all the time that we have left for today. But thank, join me in thanking Robert Kagan for his words. His book will be available for sale and for signing. Thank you so much. Thank you.